Beyond the Ranch with Jay Gunnan from Find the Ranch. Welcome to Beyond the Wrench. My name is Jay Ganinen and I am your host. Today is a, a really great day for me and, uh, and I'm excited because I, I get to welcome my friend Jim Mathis uh, to the program. He's the CEO of WyoTech. Uh, Jim's got a fascinating story for those of you that don't know him. Uh, and today I'm, I'm just really excited to, to sit down and talk with him. So how are you doing, Jim? I'm doing great, Jay. Thank you. Good. I have to start with uh, a question, which is you gave me a book when I was out visiting you in uh, Wyoming. Do you recall what that book was? Yes, R.G. Laterno by, or it's Mover of Mid and Mountain, Mountains by R.G. Laterno. Yes. yes. And I, I read the book. I finished the book. It was incredible. Uh, really inspirational story that he had of kind of trials and tribulations of, of building a pretty great company. I mean, it's it's insane. So I, I appreciate you giving me that book. And it's funny that uh, that you remember that. Yes, I give them out by the hundreds. <laughs> so, yeah. So yeah, R.G. Laterno was instrumental in um, putting the blade on the Caterpillar dozer and then building some of the world's largest earth movement equipment out there. So Laterno equipment. So anybody that hasn't read the book, I strongly encourage them to do so. Yeah, and just uh, going through his his history and the, uh, I, I was just amazed at how much he was able to do with so little uh, in terms of these big, big pieces of equipment and not really, you know, it's basically doing it on a farmstead <laughs> for, for the yes. longest time. And and uh, to be able to pull that off, I mean, it just blew my mind. So uh, pr pretty cool. But your story, I think, is equally as cool. And the what you've done in your career um, I guess let's start by really kind of diving in. What, what is it that you're doing with WyoTech right now? Like, what is your role with WyoTech? Yeah, I'm the CEO of WyoTech, and I'm part owner. Uh, my brother-in-law and I partnered on WyoTech, and WyoTech's been in existence since 1966. I came the first time around in 1976 as a student, thinking I was going to own a fleet of semis, and I wanted to learn diesel mechanics. So I came to WyoTech and then uh, three months into school, I had a great instructor and great instructors changed his life and that changed mine. And so then I decided I wanted to teach diesel mechanics. And so I came to WyoTech, um, graduated and five months later as a 19 year old kid, and I'm glad I can't do that again, but as a 19 year old kid, I started teaching at WyoTech and that started a 26 year career that uh, with WyoTech, that was absolutely crazy. And I'll share more of that later. And so 26 years later, we sold it to a big uh, public company and that didn't work out. They went bankrupt. And then another company took them out of bankruptcy, ran them for three years and that didn't work out. And so they're just gonna teach out all the WyoTechs. And fortunately the employees at WyoTech here in Laramie uh, <clears throat> fought to keep WyoTech open and through a crazy experience and story I'll share later of the details, but we were able to purchase WyoTech and we started with 12 students and 12 employees. And currently uh, two and a half years later, we have 120 employees and almost 500 students. So uh, God's been good to us. So it is, it is insane, this part of the story, but let's start back kind of where it started at, right? Like in your childhood or in like your adolescence, what, what led you to even want to go to WyoTech in the first place? Like when you were trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and again, I feel very privileged and fortunate because I had no idea exactly where my career path was going to lead um, at the time. But my dad's a pastor, a uh, preacher, and he was preaching in LaGrange, Wyoming. LaGrange, Wyoming is a town at the time of 167 people not 167,000, but 167 <laughs> people. I was a young, rambunctious kid and got permission from my parents to move out of the house when I was 14 to move on a farm and ranch. And so that started a love for equipment and a love for horses and cattle. And so the ag industry. And so I farmed during the summers and went to school in the, in the winters. 
Um, but I hated school because they interrupted me riding horses and, and running equipment and mechanic and non equipment. So I set it up my freshman year uh, to graduate the end of my junior year. And I get to the end of my junior year with plans to graduate and then go on the custom combine crew to Texas and start combining wheat. So I made that commitment and was looking forward to it. And a month before graduation, the school board met and raised the credit hour requirements on three of us because three of us, three out of 12 graduating students are in, the, in my class, we're gonna graduate uh, early because we jumped through all the hoops that they uh, allowed us to do for three years. Anyway, they met with us and said, no, you aren't gonna graduate. We raised the credit hour requirements so you'll have to come back next year. And I said, well, you can raise them more if you want because I'm not coming back. I've got my career <laughs> plans and so I quit. So I'm actually a high school dropout, which um, wasn't intentional. It was planned to graduate the end of the year and the school board changed their uh, <clears throat> contract with me. Anyway, I quit, took my GD and went on the custom combine crew and was mechanicing and driving combines and driving trucks. And that winter we drove semis uh, filling in for the guy I worked for. He had, his dad had a bunch of fleet of semis. And so we filled in and drove semis and I was 17 years old driving semis and life couldn't be better and thought I'd go to WyoTech to learn diesel mechanics because I was gonna own a fleet of semis. That was my goal as a 17 year old. And so I went to WyoTech, graduated and went right back to the custom combine crew to mechanic and drive trucks and semis, thinking I was gonna own a fleet of semis. But because I had such a great instructor, <clears throat> I thought, you know, I actually wanna teach these. So five months after I graduated, I literally begged my way into teaching at WyoTech as a 19 year old kid. And I had no idea what I was doing, but um, I survived. And the first six months was rough, but um, like I said, I survived and, and then teaching became fun. And I learned my product much better because you, if you teach it, you get all kinds of questions that you never thought of. And so I <clears throat> finally mastered teaching or semi-mastered it anyway. And that started a 26 year career at WyoTech. So, so how do you how do you discipline somebody that's the same age as you when you're <laughs> when you're teaching them at 19 years old? You know, I I must have baffled them with something because <laughs> it worked, and I was a disciplinarian either. I, even you know, as a 19, I learned my product I think so well that I could outsmart them, and uh, and and in teaching is motivation. You know, it's motivating your students and getting them want, wanting to learn. And so one thing that I was able to do was, and it took me a while, it took me a good price, six months to a year, but I could read their body language to know if they were getting what I was trying to teach them or not. In the meantime, I actually got married um, about um, five months into grad, uh, five months into my teaching and so, and I was still struggling teaching. So I'd teach my wife, who is not mechanically inclined, <laughs> that if I could get her to understand, you know, how a transmission worked or a clutch worked or whatever, then I, that was my barometer to say, okay, students, you don't have a, if I can teach my wife this, you don't have an excuse. So I'd learn it. Um, and, and again, I would uh, use a lot of examples and teach them at different angles of how something worked. And, and eventually they would get it. And so I had... Again, I, I've got a lot of students out there, probably over 35,000 35, students that went through WyoTech in my 26 year career, my first 26 years with WyoTech. So That's, that is, I, I mean, to, to think about the impact you had on young lives and not even young, I mean, young and you, you could get middle-aged, whoever, I, the impact on lives is such a such a cool thing that I don't think most of us get to experience. I guess we, we do on the management side of, you know, we're getting an adult in, but you're at that point, if you're getting an 18, 19, 20 year old in that is really just starting their life, their professional life, especially uh, to mold them to be able to be a, a professional, um, that's, a, that's a deep, deep impact. I mean, there's, there's not a lot of other professions that can say that. And you're absolutely right, Jay. And the and it's absolutely fun. I just literally, before I came into my office to take this podcast, I went out and test drove a semi 
Um, a student just put in a new clutch, new transmission, and and they needed someone to go test drive it. So I said, I'll I'll go do it. And I've got my CBL license. And so I jumped in and got it back out of the shop, which was kind of crazy with all the equipment and everything else. And we took it around to uh, about a mile, two mile square block. And uh, it rode and drove perfect. And I couldn't congratulate that student. The student that put it in, he, he rode with me. And all I could do is thank him and encourage him. And I said, you did an awesome job. This thing ships great. And um, the high, low works the whole bit, you know. So <laughs> anyway, I still love seeing students learn and get excited about what they uh, can do. So at a young age. So, so uh, in your first 26 years, talk to me about the progression from, you know, you starting off as a young instructor and as you start to go and you're, you're getting more experience under your belt and you're growing, how was how was that? I mean, were you were you a an instructor for twenty six years, or did you start to graduate up the ladder as you you know as you had your tenure kind of growing? Like, how how did that look? Yeah, it, it's a crazy story and an exciting one. And again, most people have valleys in their life personally as well as professionally, and I'm no different. And I think um, what. I learned at a young age is to go through valleys if you can gracefully. And I give credit to my Lord and Savior, um, Jesus, that because he, he's allowed me to go through valleys personally and professionally. And I thank him every day for it because if you don't go through the valleys with the right attitude, um, you can get pretty down on yourself and other people. And fortunately, I uh, learned to forgive um, and be forgiven because I've made my fair share of mistakes with people and processes and everything else as well. But to start off with, again, I left home when I was 14, got mechanically inclined as well as ag agriculturally inclined and love equipment, love horses, love animals. And ended up, again, begging my way to teach at 19 years old. And, and that was quite a story because I was actually at my own combine. I was 19 years old, had my own combine lease. I was combining corn in Broken Bow, Nebraska, and heard that they had an opening for a diesel instructor. And that's all I needed because I'm a persistent person. <laughs> I believe in something I'm going to go after is until I die trying. And um, so on Monday, I was eight miles away from Broken Bow, Broken Bow Nebraska, combining corn, parked the combine at noon, went to find a payphone on Main Street in Broken Bow, Nebraska, because of course, this is before cell phones, <laughs> and <clears throat> called Dave Hill, who was the program director for Diesel. And I said, Dave, I'm, I said, I'm Jim Mathis. And I said, I understand you have an opening for a diesel instructor, and I'd like to come up and interview you. And he said, Jim Mathis, Jim Mathis. He said, did you graduate from Watech? And I said, yes, sir. He said, well, when did you graduate? I said, in, in June, and this was in October. Uh, and he says, he just started laughing. He said, well, how old are you? I said, I'm 19. And he just broke out laughing. He said, there's no way I'm hiring a 19-year-old to teach 19-year-olds and old. And I said, Dave, I've got a lot of experience for a 19-year-old. I left home when I was 14. I've been taking with this stuff, mechanic and on it ever since I was 14. And he said, there's no way I'm hiring a 19-year-old. So that was Monday. So <clears throat> Wednesday, if people have driven equipment or trucks or whatever, you have a lot of time to think. So by Wednesday, I thought, you know what? I'm not done pursuing this job. So I called him back again and he took the call and he said, this is Dave Hill. And I said, I'm Jim Mathis. And I said, Dave, I really like to come up and talk to you. He said, absolutely not. I'm not hiring a 19 year old. So I, he, he hung up. So Friday, I called him back again. And I said, this is Jim Mathis calling for Dave Hill. And he answered phone. He says, I'm not talking to you. He hangs up on me. <laughs> So Sunday, I parked the combine and I thought he is going to talk to me or kick me out of his office. So I drove to Laramie on a Sunday, uh, grabbed a hotel room Sunday night and walked into his office Monday morning unannounced, scared to death. I was, I was actually a very shy kid back then, but I was always determined and walked into his office. And all I could do is go up to his office, stick my hand out over his desk. And he was sitting down and he smoked those real thin cigars. And he stands up, takes a big puff, he sticks his hand out. And I said, Dave, I'm Jim Mathis, and I want to teach for you. And he shook my hand. He said, you're the most determined SOB I've ever met in my life. He said, you're hired. Um, so I, he said, when can you start? And I said, well, I, I got to I turn my combine back, finish my combine contracts, and turn my combine back in. 
I said, it's going to be about five weeks. And he said, okay. He said, I come in five weeks. So I finished all my jobs in Broken Bow, Nebraska and got my combine turned back in and uh, started a crazy career. But I only taught for, believe it or not, about two and a half years. And then I became assistant training director. So I came out of the classroom and then I would fill in for instructors that were on vacation or if we're short an instructor or whatever, and then did all the live work. We used to take in a lot of live work, which we still do today. <clears throat> and so I was responsible for all the live work curriculum and everything else. So I got my first promotion when I was about 21, uh, 21 and a half years old. At about 23 or 24, Dave Hill uh, quit. And then <clears throat> Dave Cermak was my boss. And Dave Cermak is, is in Minnesota. He's an awesome mentor um, and great friend of mine. But I kind of followed him up and he became vice president of, of education. And then I became training director. So, so I held the assistant training director job for about five years. <clears throat> and then in... Uh, got another promotion. It was training director for all of our diesel programs. So I was the boss of diesel and set the vision and direction for diesel and, and had eight or nine instructors underneath me. Life was good. Held that job until August 20th, 1990. Our biotech had gone through a change of ownership. <clears throat> I was actually in a board meeting for the University of Wyoming's credit union. Somehow I got a, a credit uh, a board position on their credit union, which was a great learning experience to get understand more numbers and data and everything else, banking, and uh, got called out of that that board meeting, emergency meeting back at Wild Tech on August 20th, 1990. And I don't remember dates real well, but I remember that one because I got fired. Um, I was driving my boss nuts for the previous year. I knew I was driving him nuts because he was driving me nuts. Um, and, but he was still my boss and knew that he was miserable and I was miserable. He wanted me to quit and get my bachelor's degree. And he said, you'll never go any farther, um, than you are right now without your bachelor's degree. And I said, Alan, I said, I got a young family, got a mortgage. I don't see me quitting and getting my bachelor's degree. I said, not, I said, that's just not me. Um, I said, I'm a hands-on, you know, person with a, as far as a leadership and management style. And I like to be in with my guys and, and at a secretary and everything else as far as hands-on, helping students, helping my employees. And I says, getting a bachelor's degree is not in the works right now. I said, well, that worked for me professionally as well as personally, just not my cup of tea. Um, and so, but he kept pushing me and I kept pushing back for almost a year and, and, and until August 20th, 1990. And, and then I got called out and he fired me. And I knew it was coming because I was miserable and I was making him miserable and everybody else. So I was at complete peace with that. <clears throat> the next day I go to get my final check and I happened to run across the president of the company. So as a vice president fired me, I was at a director level. And I came across the president and I, when I reached out to shake his hand, I said, Terry, I said, I suppose me getting fired means I'm not gonna become your next vice president. And he, 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 he was shocked that I was joking. And so when he looked up at me, I was smiling and he laughed. He said, I, said, I, said, I suppose that's what that means. But he says, have a chair. And we ended up talking for two hours. And um, long story short, didn't think anything of it. Left. The next day, I'm laying on the couch, unemployed, wondered what I wanted to be when I grew up. And the phone rings at seven o'clock in the morning. And my wife picks up the phone and she answers and it's the president and she I think it's Terry Harrison and so she brings me the long cord over to my couch that I'm laying on and he says what are you doing I said I'm laying here wondering what I want to be when I grow up and, and he laughed he said I know what you want to be you want to be my vice president I said yes sir he says I need to hire you he says uh, someone with your attitude will make a great vice president for training I said well what about the vice president that fired me he says this company's big enough for both of you he said, and I said, great. I said, when do you want to show up? He says, Friday. So I was fired on a Monday, <laughs> let, unemployed for three days and came back to the promotion. And fortunately or unfortunately, depending on, I guess, how you look at it, the vice president that fired me could not take being overridden. So he quit and I had his job. Wow. And so my, again, I don't brag. I don't want to come across as bragging about my career or anything else. 
because uh, God, God has taken me through some amazing journeys and valleys, and some of them were painful, but uh, they always came out where I needed to be on the other end. So he redirected me, and that's the one a big time of redirection. He, he allowed me to come back as a vice president, which was awesome. So uh, again, the vice president fired me quit, so I had his job. I had that job for four years, <clears throat> and our WildTech changes the ownership again. We went from being under Phillips Colleges, now to Bankers Trust. Phillips Colleges went broke. Bankers Trust was the, was the fourth largest bank in the United States. They owned WildTech because of a bad debt from Phillips Colleges. So they took one school out of 93 over and it was WildTech. And so they were a great ownership, but they brought in a new president and he was kind of tough. And after nine months, he demoted me to nothing. Um, so I went from vice president down to no office, lost my secretary, all my, I had 65 employees at the time underneath my umbrella and went to the janitors working for me and the um, maintenance guys wow. with no office. And, uh, and so that was really rough. Uh, I tell everybody I walked on my bottom lip for about a week. And then I thought, you know, put your smile back on and enjoy the ride because you don't know where it's going to take you. One of the things I point out is for several <clears throat> years earlier, I, 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 I was praying. I said, God, I says, I don't see what these, these presidents that come in from the outside have over what I could do. I said, I, I don't think I could do any worse. Well, I probably could have um, done worse <clears throat> had I, uh, gotten in that position too early. And I didn't realize that, but they, you know, you need that sales and marketing background. Well, unfortunately, I did not like sales and marketing because I had to deal with the recruiters that recruited students. And a lot of times they would tell <clears throat> half-truths or not sure what they told students, but they were not truthful to some of our students. And so I didn't know it at the time. So I'm doing nothing. And the company started sliding a little bit. And so Bankers Trust, after about uh, another eight months, they stepped in and forced the president to get me involved with admissions and marketing. And it was a rough meeting because I didn't want anything to do with it, but I was not doing anything. So I was biting my tongue. Yeah. And um, the president was saying, Mathis doesn't know anything about admissions and marketing. And he was 100% right. <laughs> uh, and, but I was forced into admissions and marketing. And long story short, I absolutely fell in love with it because it's analytical, it's looking at historical data. And the president that demoted me, we actually became very good friends. <clears throat> and he was the smartest man I've ever worked for before in my life. Wow. And I could see now looking, took, took me a year or two, but I could see why he was so frustrated with me because he was, he was on another level but fortunately, he kind of took me under his wing and taught me uh, so much about everything from negotiating leases and purchases and sales and marketing and contracts. And um, I, got a, I got my bachelor's degree without getting a degree. Sure. Trust me, I, I learned so much. And unfortunately, he <clears throat> left it about another year and a half later. And then um, I became president. And I changed our philosophy a little bit from what he had as far as how to sell and market. And away we went. We just took off growing like you would not believe. And to a point where we had to build new buildings um, or shut off our sales and marketing. And so bankers trusted because they, we were in the workout <clears throat> situation with a bankrupt company, parent company, um, they did not want to build buildings. So we were sold to Allied Capital so I was a president and CEO at that time, and we sold to Allied Capital. And then <clears throat> Allied Capital allowed us to build um, a couple hundred thousand square foot of additional buildings on their watch. And so we bought 120 acres and a couple hundred thousand square foot buildings in West Laramie with the intention to build our whole campus out in West Laramie. Um, and because we had, with the 200,000 square foot additional buildings, we had 550,000 square foot um, <laughs> under roof and growing like you would not 30% growth rate a year. Yeah. And so we got two build, big buildings built, 120 acres bought. And then they called me one day um, and they said, Jim, we're selling you. Um, and oh. so I, we had a master plan to get to, you know, uh, three, four, five thousand students. 
and we're at a little over 2,000 students. And so we sold to Corinthian colleges and closed uh, in July 1st of 2002. And Corinthian colleges, they had their own executive team and they had their visionaries and they did not need my vision and, and went, would not accept my vision. So long story <laughs> short, that was when I thought WyoTech was that done with my career. And so I resigned uh, three months after we sold and bought a cattle ranch and uh, thought I'd ranch for <clears throat> the rest of my life and kind of retire and play at it. But I didn't realize that you can spend a lot of money ranching and nothing coming in. So <laughs> but went broke. But so, well, before we move on to that yes. part, I, I, I want to talk to you about the relationship when, when you're a president of an organization and you're dealing with... Uh, one ownership changes, but then they're all, like the investment or banking side of that relationship, right? Like when you're when you're dealing with them, are you talking? I mean, is everything based on numbers, or how how does that like how, how do you communicate with that parent company? And is it a change from when you go from maybe more of that educational communication to that you know more of that investor like trying to have those conversations? Yeah, so. It, I look back and there are significant um, opportunities and happenings in my career that were, at the time, I just didn't understand. But I prayed, I said, God, I said, again, <clears throat> I said, I don't see what some of these presents have that I don't have. Well, one was a financial background, sure. you know, and he allowed me to get elected to a, you know, a credit union board, which again, got me into some finance, which again, I didn't understand how, I ran against these PhDs running for the office and I just had a little blurp in the newspaper and, and I get elected from the University of Wyoming people. Nobody else voted. Um, and why, I, to this day, I don't understand. I give credit to God. So that got me a little bit on the banking and loan aspect of it. And then when Phillips Colleges had us, um, when I had got fired and then rehired, <clears throat> we... Phillips Colleges, they had close to 100 schools out there, and they wanted us to do budgets continually. And they, they forced us to play with numbers and take sales and push it back into the latter half of the year. It was all fake. Right. But just to understand, I thought it was the biggest waste of time ever. And it was from a truthful standpoint. But what it did was I could read spreadsheets uh, p l so quick and so fast. And again, I didn't understand. I, I was frustrated with Phillips Colleges for making us play games with numbers. And that's what it was. We were playing games with numbers. There's, but this, the flip side is I could look at a spreadsheet and, and say, this doesn't make sense. And yes, we're playing with numbers, but I could read a p l statement so quick and so fast. And I, again, we spent months playing with these numbers. So then <clears throat> we were owned by Bankers Trust. So I had a pretty good background of what, what companies wanted, what financial institutions wanted. They wanted numbers. And yes, they were, Bank Trust was an awesome ownership and they allowed us to grow and, and let me put my spin on it because, um, and because they're just great people. Yeah. And so, but still quarterly, I'd either fly back to New York City and Bankers Trust was the fourth largest bank in the United States in the United States at that time. And they were right across the street from the World Trade Center Towers. Well, again, you take a kid from LaGrange, Wyoming, 167 <laughs> people. I was shy. And to get them, to, you know, 15 years later, I'm flying to New York City <laughs> and riding the subway and everything else for a Wyoming cowboy. It was quite an amazing experience. And I would yeah. stay, stay in the Marriott in the World Trade Center Towers. And to think in 2001, they came down, which oh was unbelievable. Goodness. In fact, Banker's Trust Building had to be torn down because it shook it so bad it cracked all the brick and block and everything oh else. Gosh. But um, again, for a Wyoming kid, a high school dropout with a GED, in Banker's Trust, the conference room we used, looked out at the Statue of Liberty, you know? And I'm thinking, how can this happen for a kid from a, you know, <laughs> A preacher's kid to be able to do this was just unbelievable. You know, to be given pre presentations to the executive team at Bankers Trust. Um, it's insane. And listen to me. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> it's just crazy what 
what an honor I've had for such a great career, you know? So anyway, to answer your question about financials, and yes, you know, most of the <clears throat> private equity groups and big banks, they want numbers. And fortunately, I learned numbers under uh, the president that demoted me. And trust me, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me because one, I think he wanted me to quit. I was too stubborn or stupid to quit. And I didn't quit. And it was the best thing ever in my career that I didn't quit and I sucked it up and I got over being hurt real quick and said, you know what, I'm going to make the best of it. And again, six, eight months later, bankers trust stepped in, forced him to get me involved with admissions and marketing. And this guy was a walking genius. Oh. Um, and he taught me so much about contracts, backing into numbers, looking backwards at data, projecting forward with data. It was the greatest education I've ever had. So I, uh, it, it, it is crazy how life works that way. And yes, I, I give you a lot of credit for, you know, at that point in your life of not just, you know, packing it in, right? Like it would have yeah. been easy to go, you know, to pack it in and go do something different. And you had a lot of other loves with, uh, like you said, with the equipment and cattle and yes. all of that. So, I mean, to, to really bite your lip and just kind of take the demotion and roll with the punches. I mean, that's, that's incredible. I, I don't know a lot of people that would have done that. And that's uh, that says a lot about you. Well, I, again, I, I'm either too stubborn or too stupid um, <laughs> to, to take the hint, <laughs> but I, I was just determined that, Wildtech wasn't done with me and, and uh, that I could add value. And I think I did. Um, several months later, I, I started adding value and learning admissions and marketing. And little did I know that, again, I'd set my goal to be president years earlier when I was running academics. Well, I would have had the greatest academic department ever uh, had I become president, but I didn't did not understand sales and marketing. So it was God's way of demoting me and giving me a different career path. Make you learn uh, the other side. Sales and the marketing. And something I thought I would hate because I ha had to deal with students in, in academically when they were at, because of what the recruiters had told them. Now I was, I was a trainer. So guess what? I could train our sales force to what uh, because I was a teacher, I was a trainer. Right. So now I can train salespeople on how I wanted it done and wow. the facts. And so it was an added benefit. So I, I learned sales and they learned what to say and not say. Uh, so we didn't get in trouble. So it was a truly a benefit for, for everybody. So what, uh, so what, give me an idea. What year was it when your first stint with WyoTech was like when, when you were done? So I, I got to go through my timeline, but I got fired August 20th, 1990, and then um, came back as a VP. So it would have been about 94 um, when I got demoted to nothing, and probably in the 95 time frame when I um, came back into the admissions and marketing side of things. And then the president at the time, he left in 96, and then they actually brought an interim director in. Um, he was actually the CFO for Ford, retired guy. Wow. He was friends of, with Bankers Trust. And so our company was at a crossroads, I should say, because we had a lot of, of turmoil in the company. Uh, so too many changes too fast. And so they brought him in just to kind of settle Stabilize. things down. Yeah. And then with with and then he guided me into becoming president a year later. So I became president, I think, in about 1997. And at that point, you guys were all over the place, like in terms of like your marketing, your I remember as a kid growing up and I liked a lot of car shows and that kind of stuff. And you couldn't go anywhere without seeing a Wyotech ad. Right. I mean, you guys were everywhere. Yes. And and under the president, president that demoted me. We spent a lot of TV advertising on just broadcast. So we go into Chicago and buy cheap ads at midnight or whatever and run ads. So we were, and, and we had a team in Fort Collins, Colorado, a department in Colorado, where they would um, recruit students over the phone. We also had 27 or 28 recruiters across the United States that would visit high schools and and tell Wyotech story, generate leads, and then they'd follow up on the leads and get students to Wyotech. But when I took over, I, I liked data. 
And so I started analyzing all the um, results from our Fort Collins office. And it looked like all these TV ads uh, and leads were really converting good. Well, after digging into it, they really were not converting that good. It was that they were, uh, if a recruiter left, whether he got fired or quit or whatever, they would handle all the previous lead, but they were crediting those to the TV spin. Mm. And so it looked like TV was knocking it out of the park when in reality, a lot of those leads actually came from high school recruiters that had left for whatever reason. So <clears throat> I decided to shut, we had 11 people in that office. So after I did all my analysis and everything else, I went down and met with them. I said, listen, I says, we're going to shut off. This is in October. I said, we're going to shut off all TV advertising effective January 15th because we had some contracts we had to fulfill. And uh, so they literally were scared to death. They said, well, you're going to let us off. You're going to shut my depart our department down. I said, I don't know. I said, I'm just trying to be honest. I said, I don't want to. And I says, we got a lot of smart people in us. I said, I think we can figure out a way to keep you. And figure out how to get leads a different way. But I says, we're done with TV advertising as we know it. And so a couple of them quit right away. They got scared. And there's a, one of my heroes, and I've got quite a few heroes in my life. Uh, one of my heroes was Susan Dalton. And she was, and I'm making all kinds of changes as new president because yeah. I cut through the BS and we're going to do things uh, my way because I, I see opportunities and see some wasteful spending here and there and education, everything, everything else. So Anyway, in about November, uh, maybe December, <clears throat> Susan Dalton calls me and she's very nervous because I'm making all kinds of changes in the company, trying to get us over the hump and, and change our philosophies and change our culture and everything else. So she's nervous because I said no more TV advertising in fact, of January 15th. And so first thing she said was, Jim, she says, I know you said you wouldn't do any more TV advertising, but she says, there's a new uh, TV program co coming out called Horsepower TV, no, excuse me, Hot Rod TV. Hot Rod TV, yeah. And it was spin off of Hot Rod Magazine. And she says for $110,000 or something like that, she says, we can air, we can be part of their show. Um, and I says, give me a contract to sign. And she says, what? <laughs> I says, give me a contract to sign. I says, I'm ready to go. I said, that's our demographic. Yeah. Uh, because we taught street rod and, and how to build hot rods and chassis fabrication and everything else in addition to automotive and diesel and toys and finishing. I said, give me a contract. And she's really, I said, absolutely. I said, this is our answer, you know, to, to keep your, your department going. <clears throat> and so a month or two later, we signed a contract <clears throat> and with a hot rod TV. Little did I know our competitor had a contract with Hot Rod Magazine, an exclusive contract with Hot Rod Magazine. So they tried to come in and say, well, you can't have an exclusive contract. And the film producer that put this on, he honored our contract. So they were going to get sued over it by Hot Rod Magazine and this other company. So he says, you know what? I don't think I need your name at all. So they changed the name of Hot Rod TV to Horsepower TV. So if you ever wonder, if you look at history, yeah. it started off as Hot Rod TV, then it went to Horsepower TV. I did not know that. the guy honored our, con our exclusive contract. Um, and long story short, we knocked it out of the park. So it gave us credibility. We're on daytime TV shows of Horsepower. Started off Hot Rod TV, then became Horsepower TV. And that, back then, everybody watched TV. Yeah, People don't watch TV like they did back then, but it just really put us on the map um, and it gave credibility to our high school recruiting initiative. We had more leads than we could work. And so our Fort Collins office was saved and they worked those leads and we really started growing like a hockey stick. Wow. Um, yep. That, that's incredible. And like, where do these, where do they shoot these shows at? Um, it was in Nashville. Um, wow. And so they would come actually, actually they shot a lot of those shows here. Right. Because we had an exclusive contract. So they came out and, and videotaped our, our street rod building, our chest fabrication, and, and we sent people back there as far as for other shows. So, yeah, that was a boost in the arm like you would not believe. I believe I do believe it just because I, I growing up, I was that demographic and like it just yeah. it, it, it was so impactful and it looked so cool. And it was, you know, they were so well done. Uh, the commercials were and. 
I, uh, you know, I think it's one of those, one of those things where it makes you kind of aspire to get there, right? Like, and, and absolutely makes you think about Wyoming, right? Like, how do I get to Wyoming and that kind of thing? So you guys did your job there. Uh, so the next phase of your life was ranching, right? Like you, after you kind of got out of your first, you know, your first yeah, so run with Wyotech. I left Wyotech in October of 2002 after we sold it July 1st of 2002 and bought a cattle ranch in 2003, thinking I'd just go back kind of to the farm and ranch um, and kind of retire there. I was only 44, 45 years old. And I knew I wasn't going to retire, but I wanted to work. And it was a decent sized cattle ranch. It's 4,400 acres. And <clears throat> so I started buying cows and this and that and realized there was no money in ranching. And so my first year of revenue was, was uh, $15,000. <laughs> I'm used to dealing with, not personally, but I was used to dealing with millions <laughs> like of company, dollars yeah. of sales at WildTech. And then to have a sale year of 15000 <laughs> I thought, oh, this is not going to work. So anyway, in 2006, <clears throat> I was called by a pr private equity guy, and he says, are you interested in doing a, a turnaround company in California? And he bragged about his millions and his partner, his billions, and, and money, quote, unquote, was no object. And I said, you bet I'm interested. Uh, and I was ready to get around people. I love leading people. I don't call myself a very good manager, but I love setting a vision I love setting standards and promoting people that really want, have a heart to, to, to grow and learn. And, and so long story short, I took a turnaround company in California. We had uh, nine schools in California, two in Atlanta and one in Florida. And they're literally hours away from going bankrupt. And so I stepped into that <clears throat> and boy, did I get a heck of an experience there. But you learn about uh, numbers and cash flow real quick. Wildtech had always been cash flow positive, and I go to something that was losing uh, 1.1 million dollars a month, oh. uh, and had zero dollars on the balance sheet when I went oh, out. Oh my goodness! In fact, we had several million dollars past due, and again, it was is uh, two vendors, and it was going to go bankrupt had I not stepped in. And fortunately, God blessed us there as well. We had class action lawsuits that I knew about when I signed on. And within a year, we got past all the class action lawsuits. We're cash flow positive. And that thing started, really started taking off. I left after the next year. So I was there two years as CEO. And then um, stayed on the board for another four years. And then another company hired me to do some consulting as far as training on the admissions and marketing side for high school recruiting admissions. And so they had campuses in Orlando, Florida, Denver, and LA, actually Hollywood. And so I did that for two years and it was out of my realm. It was um, <clears throat> Full Sail University and, and um, LA Film School. And I don't understand that <laughs> or the curriculum, but I understand business and marketing. And so that I think was a success. And then another private equity group called me out of Connecticut. Well, they're out of Chicago, but they had schools in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and asked if I'd go help them <clears throat> turn around a school chain up there. And I said yes, and really made a whole culture change there and got them back to profitability. Um, and they were profitable, but it was sinking pretty quick. And <clears throat> took them over two years later, could leave with a good feeling uh, that they were on the right track, and they were. And then another private equity group out of New York, they had schools in Florida, Texas, and Oklahoma. So they were losing money hand over fist. And so I went to Florida, their headquarters is in Florida, took that company over as CEO. We were able to right the ship for both. They had two different school chains that they tried to merge. That was a disaster. Long story short, we were able to break them back apart and then get those schools sold to two different um, private equity groups that had other schools that fit their demographics. Uh -huh. And so we got those schools all cash flow positive and sold uh, within two years. Wow. Then back at the ranch and thought, <clears throat> in the meantime, I bought another large cattle ranch, 33,000 acres with my brother-in-law. And we got that <clears throat> going good. And I grew my cow herd up to around 600 head of cows. <clears throat> and then thinking I was just gonna keep ranching and then about uh, four years ago, I was 
actually praying. I said, God, I said, I think I've got one more turnaround. I'm getting a little bored at the ranch. I think I've got one more turnaround in me. And I take something on. And in October of 2017, I had weaned my calves. I was training my border collies and praying. I said, God, I said, I think I've got one more turnaround. And then the next month, I hear Wild Tech is closing down. And um, I thought, well, they're teaching all the schools out. They're going to teach Wild Tech out. And I thought, boy, that'd be great to get back to my school because I considered Wild Tech my school, even though I didn't own it. Yeah. Um, but it was my baby that I loved. And I thought, well, it won't be Wild Tech because you're starting with zero revenue because they're teaching all, all the students and closing it down. So no investor in the right man, in the right mind would would uh, buy Wild Tech because you start with zero revenue. Right. There were no students. And so <clears throat> that was in October, November, December of 2017. And then in January, I hear that they're going to be sold to the community college in Cheyenne and they're going to buy it. Um, later in January of 2018, a bunch of investors contacted me uh, and leaders, business leaders in Laramie. And I met with them and they said, Jim, can you find money to buy Wild Tech? And they said, no. They said, well, you, will you find, will you try to find some and we'll try to find some? I said, okay. So I tried to find some and found three and a half million dollars. And I figured it was a $12 million turnaround. And I thought I'm not even going to make any other phone calls. It's just, it's not going to happen. Right. Um, so that was end of January. End of February, I'm out feeding my cows uh, in a tractor and I get an email and I normally don't take my cell phone with me, but for that particular day, I had my cell phone and had an email from a state representative and this email said, you don't know me, but you know my brother, I'm Bob Nicholas. And he said, can you be here in an hour to meet with us? Uh, he said, all the senators and representatives, they're in session. And can you be here in an hour to meet with us to answer questions about wild <laughs> And so I emailed back real quick. I says, no, but I can be there an hour and a half because we're an hour and 10 minutes away. And I wanted to take a shower and change. Um, so I ran into the house, quit feeding my cows, ran into the house and, and took a quick shower and drove as fast as I could to Cheyenne. Bob comes out of session and the rest of the day, he has me meet with uh, senators and state representatives. And at two o'clock in the afternoon, I had a meeting. They scheduled a meeting with uh, this, the president of the Senate. And I had no idea who he was. His name is, um, I think we're here in a second. I just lost uh, <laughs> Eric, Eric Bebop. And, uh, and I'd never heard of him before in my life. Uh, <clears throat> so I meet Eric Bebop and there were seven other senators in front of his big old desk. And he picked my brain and my turnaround experiences and wild tech. And then he cuts to the chase. He says, Jim, says, we're about ready to give $5 million to the community college to buy wild tech. And we don't think it's necessarily a good idea. I said, well, it's not unless you want to fund it every year because they don't have a break-even plan. And he said, well, what happens if I just loan that to you over 10 years at 2.5% interest? He said, would that help you find the rest of your money? I said, make all the difference in the world. Yeah. And immediately, he barks in order to the senator right beside me. <clears throat> he says, go get um, Dave Gruber. I didn't know who Dave, Dave Gruber was, but he was the bill writer. So Dave Gruber comes in with his pen and paper, and he says, how can I help you, Mr. President? And Eli, Eli Bebop starts barking orders. He says, change this bill so Mathis can borrow $5 million from the state of Wyoming. Um, wow. And long story short, it's a longer story than that. But um, they passed a bill. That was on a Wednesday. They passed a bill Friday night at 11 o'clock at night and given me authorization to apply for a loan through the state of Wyoming to borrow $5 million. And again, I share that because it's public information. I right. don't really share all my details, but it's public information. You can Google it. Um, and in the meantime, um, my uh, another family member said, I want to partner with you. So it was a crazy story from that point on with a lot of details that I it worked out. And I give God the credit because when, when it looked like it was still not going to work on several occasions, um, at the last minute, it changed and we took one more step forward. And long story short, we got the U.S. Department of Education approval um, and the accrediting body's approval because we never even had a contract till probably April. And normally it's a six month process just to get approvals through the Department of Education and the accrediting body. And we did it in about eight weeks. Um, and 
we bought WyoTech July 2nd, 2018 with 12 students and 12 employees. And uh, so it's been <laughs> you, since there. It was so incredible when I was out there uh, to visit you, the like how close it was to shutting the doors, right? I mean, you're, yes. you're, you're, not, you're not saying last minute, like as a, as a figure of speech, you're, it was last minute. <laughs> we did not know if we would close the day we closed. We had two outstanding items that our, the parent company could have pulled the plug on or we could have pulled the plug on. And we both agreed we're supposed to have them that day. And I couldn't get a certificate of insurance uh, I was waiting. I finally got it at 11 o'clock the day we closed. They had to get a permission to take over housing lease, um, and they did not have that. And I took a verbal agreement. They said, we talked to the owners. We have a verbal agreement. I said, I'll take your verbal agreement if you'll take my certificate of insurance at, at past due. And they said, okay. So we wired our funds, and uh, we literally closed 11 o'clock in the morning the day we closed on July 2nd. And I told our instructors, again, they weren't my instructor per se until we right. closed. But I said, if you're gambling with me, let's go ahead and start teaching our 12 students. And they did at seven o'clock that morning. I said, I'm pretty confident it's gonna happen, but I said, it still could go south. But 12 students gambled that we would close, 12 employees gambled that they would get a paycheck at least for one day. <laughs> so That is, I mean, yep. the intensity going through that and going, I, like I cannot imagine the toll it took on your nerves going yep. through all of that. And, and it's not like it's a, a little deal. I mean, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of, I, that's a lot of everything and yes. so many different people involved. And yes, I mean, that could be a, a story in its own. I mean, that's just, that is just insane to me. I had an investor that, um, not an investor, but he's an investor type, kind of a private equity guy that helps buy and sell businesses. And so I used him as a consultant to help work through all the details of to make sure we set up the company legally and everything else. And through the, the negotiation and process, he basically quit on me twice because he, the intensity. Um, and he wow. said, and I said, you know what? I truly believe God put this in my life and I'm going to do everything I can every single day. And if, if, if it closes or, you know, where, where, God's closed the doors on it. I will thank him for the experience. But I said, I don't think, I said, I think he's, he's, he's saying, you got, I kept reading Exodus about the Israelites leaving <clears throat> um, Exodus and, um, and going to the promised land and how many, the 10 plagues. If you read the 10 plagues on again, off again, and if you think that was, wasn't an emotional roller coaster back then, I don't have anything to compare that to. Sure. And because it's on again, off again, on again, off again. And so I thought, you know, I kept reading next to this. And I'm thinking, you know what? Um, I'm going to do what I can today. I, I believe God put this in my lap. Um, and, and long story short, I give him the credit because it shouldn't have happened. Yeah, it should not so happened, so many things that could have prevented that from happening. Yes, and that's absolutely. yeah, yeah. Yep. So give me an idea. Wyotech current day, like you, you it, you're thriving. Um, you know, I'm I'm in contact with Cindy Barlow a lot, and and talking with her, she gives me the updates uh, pretty frequently, and it's so cool to see just how much progress you've made in such a short amount of time with the school and really getting it back to kind of your values and, and what you wanted to see out of Wyotech. Um, I mean, are, are you back? Like, is it, is it like this, is it the way you want it now? And this is, you know, you've, you've got everything in order. You know, I don't know if it'll ever be, yeah. <laughs> I'm never satisfied, which is, that's a good thing. Not good, but we are on our way. We have awesome employees. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. The culture is fantastic. And I'm a big culture fan. And yeah. sometimes you got to weed a few people out uh, <clears throat> to, to develop that culture you want. But I believe we have the team on staff right now that understands our client. And my goal is to train, do our best job possible training students. That's what, and, and providing that best graduate we can to industry. So we have two customers to, to serve, our students and the employees that hire them. Mm -hmm. And so we try to keep that at the forefront of our minds the other goal I've got is I want the student to have the best experience from a training standpoint, but not only a, stand, a training standpoint, but also 
a outside of the school experience. So we spend a lot of time and effort in doing activities for our students. And I want to grow that bigger and better um, in addition to the great training we already offer. So <clears throat> we are also looking at in our diesel program as an, as an example, it's mostly geared towards trucks, some heavy equipment as far as we teach some hydraulics and, and that type of stuff. But I want to get some green green paint, some John Deere paint in there, as well as some Case IH. I'll probably have to succumb to that. Brother-in-law <laughs> brother is a Case IH guy, and I'm a who partner with me in Wild Tech, and, uh, and I'm a green paint guy. So we'll probably have to buy one Case IH and about a dozen green trucks. <laughs> uh, but um, I want to get have them get a touch of ag, and then eventually in our advanced diesel program, I want to get into some heavy equipment. Mm -hmm. So, and we're also talking about possibly in a year or two, probably two or three years, um, starting a heavy equipment operating school um, with CDL license. So that's one of our goals. Yeah. In our automotive program, starting in July, we've added light duty diesel. So we were going to start training on Chevy uh, Dodges and Fords, yeah. um, light duty diesel. So we're in the process of buying pickups right now. So... Um, but we have our curriculum pretty much uh, designed to add that to our, our automotive program. So an automotive student will not only get, learn about automotive, but they'll also get all the emissions and electronics on a on light duty diesel pickups. So it's exciting. Um, I mean, yes. it's, it's really exciting to see the progress and see, you know, are, are you one campus now, right? One campus. We have, I mentioned earlier that years ago when I was here before, we bought 120 acres out here. Well, during Corinthian College's demise, they lost that in their bankruptcy. So mm. long story short, I bought 70 acres back when we <laughs> bought WildTech. Um, so we have 70 acres to expand on. We're already expanding our campus right now. We're adding uh, a 5,000 square foot addition on to add classrooms for our automotive program to expand. We also have an architect designing a 90,000 square foot addition to our other building. And so we're waiting for prices on that to figure out how we're going to finance that and do that. And we want to double our automotive uh, program because we believe with light duty diesel, that will drive a lot of interest to our automotive program. So we think we can double that over the next three or four years. So we, we're going to need a 90,000 square foot addition to that. To backfill where automotive is now, I think we'll start probably a welding school in about two years as well. Wow. So <clears throat> we teach a lot of welding and fabrication in the chassis automo chassis phase, uh, automotive chassis phase. Uh, but we, I should say chassis fabrication phase. But we think that we want to go with um, maybe either additional welding program or add to the chassis fabrication standpoint. So... Yeah, a lot of, lot of ideas, a lot of goals. Um, my problem is I'm running out of time. <laughs> I hope not. I think we'll see most of this accomplished. I so. think you will. It's it's uh, the way you move, and uh, and how much effort you put into it. I I have no doubt that you're going to see that. The the last thing I want to talk about, um, just in in the biotech standpoint and, and hopefully I think I might be even going over your time a little bit here so hopefully you don't mind that but we um we it's interesting to see kind of the notable people that have come out of Wyotech and and the you know not 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 to um undersell some of the the folks that come out and work at a dealership or an independent shop you or just whatever mute on me oh I, I did uh can you can you still hear me or no oh I can oh sorry about that so when we talk about like some of the notable people that have come from Wyotech, I mean, you, you've had some notable people coming out of there, right? I mean, and not only that, when I was out there, I was able to experience, um, I met a couple gentlemen that Cindy uh, introduced me to. We went out to dinner. They were former instructors and they were talking about, you know, relationship with Chip Foose and like with, you know, some of these people, it's just insane. And um, was it Jesse Combs that? Uh, Jesse Combs was a graduate of Wyotech and that started here, her amazing career right. you know, in the industry and in racing cars and, and fabrication and stuff. So yeah, we've had amazing, we've got so many um, past graduates 
that either own their shops, own their businesses, are TV personalities. Um, it's truly amazing. So, and I think it's our culture and our structure. We are so unlike other schools because we go to school eight hours and 20 minutes a day. It's very concentrated. Students are forced to wear uniform shirts. They sign a contract that they will show up on time. We have an attendance policy. If they miss three days in a six week period, we kick them out um, because we take our training very serious. And so, <clears throat> and our demographics is a 19, 20 year old as a whole with parent support or military. So um, we, we had, do have a different clientele and it's a challenge to recruit students because you've got to find the right one that can afford us. Uh, and normally that's with parent support. And, but what we do for them is set that culture and the guidelines. And if they do their part, we obviously do our part and there's a successful career out there for them if they want it. So. Well, you, you've built one heck of a school. Um, I, I, uh, you talked about heroes earlier and, and you're certainly one of mine. I think I, I, well, really, I, I really look up to everything that you do and uh, had the pleasure of spending some time with you at your ranch and uh, just uh, uh, really thank you for coming on the program today. It's, it's an honor to have you on and, and uh, um, just, uh, just really enjoy watching what you do out there. Well, thank you. It's my privilege and, and by all means, come out and visit the guest again and stay at the ranch. I, I'll take you up on that. I, I uh, to wanted it. to look at the antelope and the uh, the elk and all of that. That was uh, that was so much fun. So I uh, I uh, I will take you up on that. We'd love to have you. All right. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it.